Welcome to Online Ops Script, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, Online Optimism's New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Social Media Director. This week, we're talking about building a company with a perpetual business model and distributed capitalism. Keep listening to find out what that is. Our guest today is Ben Johnson, founder and CEO of Techno Technology Services, a 100-plus person tech company in Lafayette, Louisiana. Techno is founded in 2010 out of Ben and Michael Johnson's garage and has since been named one of the top 10 companies for economic growth in Louisiana and has expanded to Denver, Houston, and Dallas. Well, thanks for joining us, Ben. How are you? I'm doing great, other than the fact that my daughters are kicking my butt in Fortnite right now, <laughs> um, but it's, I'm, I'm doing well. All right. Well, let's get started. Can you tell us a little bit about Techno and what your company is? Sure. Um, our elevator pitch is we do boring computer stuff. Um, it's not boring to us. It's boring to most of our customers. But um, at, at, at the foundation of what we do, um, it's in our name. We're a technology services group. Um, so we help our customers with their technology and, and where we found sort of our niche and um, where we play best is, is helping our customers in their data journey. So um, from the creation of their data, all, all businesses, they have something they do to make money and, and there's processes or um, drilling for oil, right? There's devices and things that are out there and you want to understand what your business is doing and help that information on the back end in the enterprise and merge that data together to make better business decisions. And so we help along that entire data journey. It's um, we will go out and put devices out into the field or on equipment or um, create software for their people to collect the data that they're doing. And once we have that data, we'll then transmit it over networks. We create networks for our customers, WANs, LANs. We work with satellites and cells and fiber optics networks to get that data into a location where we centralize all that data in data lakes, data warehouses. And this is this is big data for our customers. It can be millions of points that are getting recorded at kind of sub-second speeds or even data that's just getting tracked once a day type thing. Uh, but we gather all that data in one place and then we help our customers turn it into information. We give it context. We normalize that data. Um, and, we, and then we help them move that data um, from their operations into their IT space, into their enterprise, where we can merge that data with um, accounting information, financials, compliance, engineering, anything that they're really doing in the back office. Um, that helps their business run better. We get all that together. We put a nice cybersecurity wrapper around it, and um, and and so that's the, that's the foundation of what we do. Without getting too much into the details and maybe making your eyes glaze over, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I can't believe that that was the gloss over. Like I feel like I already. <laughs> Got so much information. That's that's as best I can do. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Well, so I understand that Techno was either founded with like a different purpose or has a different mm. model. Can you yeah. tell us about what that is? Yes. So um always wanted to own a business since I was young. Um said after seven years being out of college, I would start my own company and um it was really based on what I saw from my family. All, all of my family owned businesses. My grandparents on both sides of my family. There was a grocery store. There was a veterinarian clinic. My dad owned his own company. My mom is kind of a serial entrepreneur before they even knew what entrepreneurs were. And I think it was more around her ADHD, but we'll call her an entrepreneur. Um, she had several businesses. And, and one thing that always stuck out with me was just getting to see the people that they affected, kind of the lives and the, the community that was built around those and I didn't realize business could affect people's lives like that and so um was working with my dad at a company and we decided hey it was actually over martinis <laughs> at a Christmas um family event and we said you know we we really we want to start a company that's focused on helping people and that's actually in our mission statement our mission statement's three sentences is and Half the people hate it at the company. Half, half the people think it's a good mission, but it's uh, we help um, customers succeed, we help each other succeed, and then we help techno succeed. And it's it's really kind of in that order. We focus a lot as a service company on our people and our customers. And then at the end of the day, techno hopefully um, benefits from that as well. But um, 
the the real seed of the idea for techno was around becoming a perpetual business based on distributed capitalism and and that came really from my dad was the one that originated the the, the base concept of what we're going with um and it happened from his previous business when he had to exit after seven or nine years of owning the company uh he was really upset with the way that the sale went and what happened afterwards. Basically the commitments he had made to his customers and his people, they kind of crumbled. It was during the dot-com boom. So not many businesses were, were, were surviving after that, but he, he took it really um, personally and wanted to have this idea for a new model, which was um, to create a sustainable business where there's an exit strategy already in place. The owners grow wealth. And so you're not dictated by having to, work 30 years, realize, oh, I haven't made any money. I need to go and sell to someone. And when you sell to someone, that someone's probably not in line with your, your maybe your morals, your values, your mission statement. They're buying you for a customer list. They're buying you for your expertise. Um, and so we have a model that allows us to continue to work without having to sell out, without having to get private equity or venture capitalists, because when you do that, you now have a moral and an ethical responsibility to those shareholders, right? To, to, to do what's best for them. And what is best for them? More money. They're looking to make money, right? <laughs> yeah. They, they want to return on that investment. They're not so much concerned about the operations of your business. And if you're doing things the right way, they're worried about that Q1, Q3 P and L and, and what your balance statement looks like. So, um, and then also if, so that's from the, the financial side of it for the owners, but then it's for the people and the customers as well, right? Again, you make those commitments. Um, it's it, it's not just business. I hate that stand, I hate that phrase. Oh, it's just business, you know? It's not. I mean, there's a lot of relationships around business. Yeah. And when you've made those commitments, you have to take that seriously and to your people to help them grow and to your customers that you're going to do what's best for them. So. So, so what is a perpetual oh. business model? What is this perpetual <laughs> model that you've built? that is different than other companies that allows you to grow without selling out? And, and how does that actually work from your side as the owner? Okay. So it's still a work in progress. <laughs> Let me say that. Um, but we have proven some of it. So uh, the, the idea behind it is that um, techno remains alive and doesn't have to be sold thereby being perpetual, but you can only be perpetual if there's people that are coming up and leading the business after you leave, right? I'm going to want to exit it sometime. I have three daughters. I'd love to go spend some more time with them and hopefully my grandchildren, whenever I, if I have those. And um, so, you know, I'm not going to be around for techno all the time. And so if, if the business is, is solely successful because of me, then it crumbles afterwards. So right. To be perpetual, you have to be focused on growing those leaders and those new owners that are going to come in. So Techno is really an umbrella company, if you think about it. And, and it's, it maybe isn't as unique as we'd like to think it is. It may kind of be like a CPA firm where there's partners and things like that. But what Techno does is we have a shared services group that handles the accounting, the HR, the payroll, the compliance, the legal, um, so that our business units underneath Techno can focus on the two things that we know are most important for a business. It's your people and your customers. And most of us as business owners, we got into business because we were really good at what we did, not because we're good at business. <laughs> I'm a, I don't know that I'm a great business person, but I'm a pretty good computer engineer. Right. Um, and so if we can allow those people to focus on what they do best, then those businesses really thrive. And we've seen that. And so what happens is I've been growing owners within the company. We, we started an IT group, uh, business services that to at first to diversify but we had two guys that really put in some sweat equity and work and so now they own business services um they're buying out michael and i from our share michael's my business partner the original founder um but they now own business services and um with obviously guidance and help from us. And there's a techno ecosystem. Um, but then also I started our enterprise services group and it was just me. Well, I've brought up a guy, he earned in some sweat equity earned. And now he's buying out a portion of, of my ownership so that he can be majority owner and I can go and focus on techno. So techno started in a garage, two people, um, 
and now we have two owners and now we have seven owners at techno um, and, and so that's the way that we want to make it perpetual. And it's the people that have grown within the business so that our customers are familiar with those people. Our uh, team members are f familiar with them as leaders. And there's no real big divide when um, when I exit, when I leave. And I've been growing wealth the whole time. I didn't leverage debt. I made sure, and all of the business owners are doing this, we've made sure that we're profitable. We're not just, it's not speculation and growth and, oh, well, you got to do some stuff to get the EBITDA up, but you know, uh, don't worry about profit, leverage debt, do those things. No, I'm worried about profit. We need to keep this business paid and I need to grow wealth right now so that I don't have to, in 30 years, sell to Matt at some insane markup that doesn't make any sense, but it's just because I haven't been good with money and I need to make some money to get out of it. So that's sort of the perpetual thing. Um, so if I could summarize it and try to, I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying. So basically what you get to do sure. is you get to hire people who you feel match the values and the work ethic and the goals of techno. And then they come in, they put in the work, you recognize that in them, you might help them develop into the leaders. So then they take on a higher role. They're going to get equity. They're going to take ownership of a portion. So that way when you're ready to go, they can step in and you make sure that techno is still being run by the people that are techno rather than some stranger who's going to manipulate it. Yes. Yes. And we may have external owners come in. We haven't ruled that out. It hasn't happened that way yet. You know, the, it's, the growth has been very organic in a sense, but that's also part of when we talk about, we want to keep the commitment to our people and provide the most opportunities as possible in other corporations I've been a part of, there's a ladder, right? There's a corporate ladder. We don't have titles at Techno. Uh, we have roles. We don't have titles though. There, and and I, I, I want to stay away from that, the Peter principle where you get, you know, a, um, elevated to your highest level of incompetence. We allow people to try different things. That includes the technical track, but then also the business track. You know, I've seen at other companies where they lost their best and their brightest because they did want to go and start their own company. Right. And, and the CEO, CFO says, oh, we can't do that. You can't make as much money as your boss. But why not? Yeah. You know, and so and th then those people leave and you've got this huge hole in the company where your best people left. And why? Because you said there was no room for them there. So we try to make room for those people. And at the same time, it helps benefit that perpetual nature. So it is kind of like, you know, a law firm or a CPA firm where you've got different partners and owners. And so when you elevate someone to that ownership level, um, do you know that going in when you hire them, you say, this is someone I think who's going to be on that management, that business side track, or do you hire people just because they're good and they're smart and they're hardworking? And then you figure out where they want to go after you've worked with them for a few years. Yeah, I, I think it's probably more the second thing, you know, those that typically I've, I've, I've found the ones that say, oh, I want to be a leader. I want to be an owner. Probably not the people that you <laughs> want to be owners or leaders. They don't realize that those things are earned. They're not right. just given, you know. And uh, it's a separate skill set, honestly. Um, it really is. And, and, and it's so intangible. Mm -hmm. You know, I can interview very well for, you know, do you have the coding skills? Can you use Excel? Do you know databases? But when it comes to, Hey, are you a good person? <laughs> do you, do you, do you lead from the front or the back or, you know, all those right. different things. And, and so, um, we talk a lot about just, just get the right people on the bus. We'll figure out we don't have a bus driver necessarily, but we'll figure out where we're going once we get the right people on the bus. So that's that's really how it's been. And, and those people tend to gravitate towards it. So the other buzzword that we've had about techno is distributed capitalism. What, yeah. what is that? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so our concept of, of that, I, I mean, love capitalism. Yay. Rah. But um, I think – it's it's been a little distorted in in the way that um, the business world uses it these days, and um, we're real big on compensating people for the value that they bring. Um, and you know, everyone here works to make profit for the company, so everyone here, in my opinion, should share in that profit. Um, and I know we've all seen these articles, Reddit, wherever of, oh, this CEO is making 350 times the average um, team member's salary. And that just is mind boggling to me. It's just, 
I how how have you become so distorted as a human being to feel that you're worth 300 times another person's value? I just don't get it. Um, so I'll never I'll never make 300 times uh, uh, team members. And, and that's built into our model because um, I was talking about how we split out business services and we have two new owners of business services. Well, that P&L, that's theirs. That is theirs to own. They they own 95 percent of the profit from that company. I don't see any of it anymore. You know, there, there's, there's expenses to techno that they cover as a, as a group, right? We all pitch in to help our shared services group uh, because they're not a, they're a cost center and they're not a, they're not a revenue center. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I don't feel I should make money off of that business anymore just because I started techno. I'm not, pro I'm providing some value to them as, as CEO, as founder and giving them guidance, but that's part of them buying me out. Right. And, and they buy me out over a period of five years. Um, and then I'm, I, I'm out of that. I'm, I'm no longer part of it. And I shouldn't be, and I don't feel that I should be. And then the other piece of that is, is every, every single group is required to profit share. Um, because we want people to experience profit and loss. Uh, well, they don't experience the loss. That's really just <laughs> on the owners, but they do experience the profit. Um, and, and, and that's why we don't call it the end of year bonus. It's not a bonus. I'm not giving this to you out of the kindness of my heart. You worked hard. You made us some money. <laughs> We're profitable. And, and most businesses, we, we like our business unit, for instance, it's 33% of our bottom line goes back to team members, 33% gets reinvested in uh, my BU and then 33% goes to the owners, Matt and I. And so, um, and, and again, that is a requirement of techno. So those two things built into where, Hey, as founders, Michael and I aren't going to forever make money off of these other business units that we're not involved in. And then also I didn't like ESOPs the way that they were handled. I thought it was a little kludgy. Um, so we, we go by a profit sharing model and we're very transparent. We show everyone what we make. We open up the books. They can dig around to their heart's content. <laughs> um, but that, that, that profit goes back to the people that, that really work to earn it. So that's there, what we talk about with distributed capitalism. Sorry. No sorry, words. I didn't mean to interrupt. But are there <laughs> any – like business leaders who you see out there and you're like, yeah, like that's, that's the, the moral way to do it. Or like, that's how I want to do it. Yikes. Um, <laughs> I honestly am so head down in what I'm doing um, that I, I haven't. Um, there's some really cool stuff uh, going on in Spain where they have some business co-ops that, that is a similar model to techno that's been around longer than techno. I didn't even know about them. Someone had um, passed me that information, but it was, it was a lot around these smaller businesses and um, again, compensating the people that do the work and not, not um, getting into this whole atmosphere, the Silicon Valley, whatever you want to call it of people not really caring about the technology. They're caring about the bottom line. They don't care about the people. They're really just, Hey, how do I look good? How do I get that uh, hockey stick EBITDA to sell to the next one and ramp up and who cares if this stuff actually works? If I marketed it well, then someone's going to buy it. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there's anyone I would say that, that, that I'm modeling um, after or I would love it. I'd love to start bouncing these ideas off of someone. So if y'all, if y'all find someone that has the same ideas, let me know. I'd love well, to chat with them. I just want to say, you know, it's just really interesting for me. I think it's really exciting that basically you built a business that you can get out of. That's first of all, something that not many people think of. Um, how do I get out of this without destroying the clients, the customers, the company that I built or the community that you're working to build for you know decades or whatever that may be. Um, and then also this perpetual business model, distributed capitalism, I think it probably makes your employees work harder because they're trying to get their <laughs> groups um, to do, you know, higher profits within those different um, groups within the company, right? I mean, you said that Techno is an umbrella company. It's basically something that has individual working groups, correct? Correct. So um, do you feel like your teams are working harder toward that uh, that profit and that profit sharing, or or how do you feel that that's affected the overall morale of of the company? 
Yeah. So idealistically, I want to say everybody should love this. It's great. We're giving right. back money. You're making it, you know, I'm on board. You yeah. bought in 100%, <laughs> right? And it sounds great in interviews and people are so excited when they get here to work. Um, and, and for the most part, it is, it is that it's people get it. They understand we're working together, um, you know, to, to, to benefit the greater good. They also aren't um, uh, demotivated by the fact that, oh, well, that, that business unit didn't do good this year. That means my profits are going to be affected. Well, no, you still worked hard. You made money. You're getting money just because that shop may have lost. You're, you're not going to. And so there is a sense of pride and, and work ethic that they know that they're going to be compensated for what they've done. There are complications in that, though, you know, as you um, it can lead to because because, again, my last focus, the, the least thing I wanted to focus on was money, right? The profit. That's why we're not private investors and venture capitalists. But then it's almost a 180 where some people can get too focused on the money. And they're like, I have to do it this way because I got to make more money. It's like, oh, no, no, we've created what we didn't want. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of creating exactly what we didn't want. Um, but right. Instead of outside in, people focused, hyper focused on the money, it's, it's, it's internally it's, generated it's in, it's inside the house. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But as, as with anything, you know, we, we try to be very transparent and, and communicate with people. And when we hear those things, we try to talk through it and help them understand, Hey, that, that's not the right mindset to have, you know, but it's, it's not, it is definitely something we found that is not inherent to, um, a person's thoughts as to how business should work. You know, they're just, it almost seems like a foreign concept to them. And so it's tough for them to kind of buy in and understand. And so it takes a few years of them being here, seeing it work. And really that's what reinforces the model with them where they say, okay, uh, I think I get it now. I think I, we're not focused on the money, but we are making money. And so I'm happy. I feel like on the internet right now, there's this whole like thing with like quiet quitting where people, you know, they just like check out of their jobs and then eventually they right. leave. And I feel like this right. has got to kind of prevent that because a lot of time people are like, I'm being overworked and I'm not going to get paid any better. Like, this is my job. This is my title. Like I've maxed out. And I feel like since people get the money that they're responsible for, it's got to be motivating. Yeah. A absolutely. That's a that's a key piece to it. Um, another piece to that, I think, is uh, uh, goes into our mission statement and um, the way that we're focused on helping people. Uh, I hear this a lot from other the quiet quitting thing is one of them. But then I also hear from other business owners like oh, those damn millennials, they don't want to work, you know, and it's like, yeah, OK, uh, well, maybe your culture doesn't incentivize them to do that. And so we compensate them not only with financially like we've been talking about but we one thing i've found with with younger generations is is they have a, a great sense of um a work life balance and but also what um the the great asset they have which is time and time is something that you, we have a limited amount of right we can't make any more of it um and it's very important in a job uh, they that they understand that they're doing something that's valuable I and mean, useful and worth their time. They're, they're spending their time away from loved ones, friends, families, hobbies, all that stuff, right? And so, um, we as a business as a business we find that it's important for us to show them that there is value in what we're doing, and that's why we highlight how we help people. Um, and and uh, other things that we do, I, I would probably go way down a rabbit hole on this, but. That's a way that techno can compensate them as well is we give them true job security is, is and job security is not if techno is going to be around forever. It's if they've built a resume that they're happy with that they can go take to any company and say, hey, that job posting you had, I want that job. You're going to pay me this amount and they get it. That is real job security. Right. And so they're coming into work knowing and that's why we don't have any titles. We want people to try things. We want them to fail. We want them to do different things and build that resume in the way that they want. So that's another valuable thing where they don't feel that they're just at a desk working 40 hours a week for no for no reason. And so that coupled, I think, is kind of that tripod for how we keep people excited and happy and challenged. Ben, can I ask you a quick question? So my, my first marketing job that I ever had, they did not give me a title. Uh, nobody mm -hmm. had titles at this company. And I was 22 and right out of college. And I was frustrated by it because I wanted yep. 
I wanted a title. I wanted something that defined the work I was doing, something I knew that th that wasn't going to be my job forever. So I wanted something that I could, um, you know, take to the next job and say, this is what I did. And this is what I was, my work was titled, you know? Um, yeah. So how, how does your, how do your employees feel about that? Especially newer employees who maybe aren't used to that. Um, how do they feel about the lack of titles and does that bother anyone? It's, it, it definitely has some disadvantages and some challenges along with it, but the way that we overcome them is, is it, it starts in the interview process. Um, we actually, our interviews, I mean, it's so hard to find people these days. The interviews have really flipped around towards, you know, you're selling the company to them as, uh, even more so than they're selling themselves to you. Uh, but it starts in that process where half of the interview is technical. But the other half is cultural. And one thing that we bring up is the fact that we don't have titles. And because it does take a certain type of person to work here and there's disadvantages to it or perceived disadvantages, I think, that people have to work through in their minds in that if we if if I don't see those titles and I don't see that escalation in my career, how do I assume how do I assign value to what I've done and how do I show that value to other people? And so we're very intentional in our meetings with people. We have them every six months with team members. Uh, we don't want them just sitting at a keyboard, banging away, putting the blinders on, look up in five years and say, oh, my God, what have I done with my career? My resume sucks. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and because we don't have those titles, it's not as it's not as in your face that you are progressing. Right. right. And so we talk with them and we bring it up and we're, we're we overly express to them. What do you like? What do you don't like? And, and we talk in in the term of roles. I know it's nuanced and people say, well, then you have titles. And yeah. it's like, well, no, our business cards don't have titles. But we talk about roles and that's what people should be responsible and accountable for and understanding that they're doing the things um, that that role implies and needs. And then when they have a clear picture of that, I tell them, look, put on your resume. You can put your the VP of, of, of technology. I don't care, <laughs> you know, but what you, what you's going to sell that, that next employer of yours is going to be those roles and the things that you actually did. You know, they're not so much going to care about the title. I know you think they do. And and especially with customers is where we see that a lot. Uh, our people are like, well, well, they don't know. They're, they're not going to know I'm the manager. They're not going to know that I'm running this thing. And it's like they, they won't initially. You're right. right. But once you've interacted with them, it's going to be abundantly clear exactly what it is you do on this. And they can call it whatever they want to call it at that point. But just so. So that's kind of how we work around it is just. That yeah, makes sense. I mean, sure for me personally, I was, uh, you know, it was a confidence thing. I was a young, yep. young employee and I, I wanted something that I could point to and say, this is what I'm good at or known for. Um, as my career has gone on, it's mattered less to me just because I have more confidence and less imposter syndrome. Yeah. So I was curious about how, uh, how your team. You got past imposter syndrome? <laughs> I, have not. I would love to chat offline. Um, I'm, how you I'm deep that. in it. I'm deep in it, but I think I'm okay. farther away than I was when I was 22. So <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah. Mir, do you have any other questions? All right. We have time for one more question. So I just want to ask, what do you cool. think is the value of having a tech company outside of Silicon Valley, especially in Western Louisiana or central. Yeah. South central. Um, it's, I think is there's the biggest thing for me is there's no biases. One, um, you know, you go to Silicon Valley, you go to Austin, you go to these different places and there's a certain feel and expectation of what people have, um, or, or what they feel is is going to be needed of them in the tech industry, right? And there's a certain perception as to what they should do and how they should work and what should be important to them. That's that's already been defined in those areas, and it's and and so to overcome some of those hurdles, if you're to start a business there, it's tough to be unique. It's tough to be creative, and we need that where in our line of business. Um, we're problem solvers. We're a service company. We're helping our customers with their challenges, with their issues, and we need people to be creative. And so without those biases, people come in and they really have a, a, a kind of a clean slate to work with and they can define how they need to do the work and um, what gets performed and and also, uh, another good thing is uh, we only have one big competitor here in town, and so the university, you know, there's there's not many people um, 
um, yeah, competing against us for the workforce. So uh, that's that's another great um, benefit to being in a non-traditional tech space. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, we're going to wrap it up now. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, if oh, someone, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. If someone wants to find you or Techno out on social media, where would they do that? Yep, they can go to um, techno.com. Uh, it's T-E-C-H-N-E-A-U-X, the Cajun spelling. Um, and then, yeah, we're on LinkedIn and, and, and Facebook. Amazing. All right. Well, thanks so much, Ben. So interesting hearing about how <laughs> your different models and hopefully other entrepreneurs are hearing this and kind of take these methods to their businesses. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks for having me. This was fun. All right. Thanks, Ben. Have a good one. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like us to discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic.